Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, God's The Love of God. And this is part four, The Compelling Power of God's Love. And this is lesson number 12 of part four. And the scriptures that we're going to look at today, and I'll tell you the title after I read the scriptures, at least from the King James. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And the title of lesson 12 is Compelled by Love into His Harvest compelled by love into his harvest. The Amplified reads this way, beginning with verse 35, chapter 9. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and curing all kinds of disease and every weakness and infirmity. When he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them, because they were bewildered, harassed, and distressed, and dejected, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. Whoa. Matthew chapter 9, 35 through 38 in we expanded translation of the New Testament. And Jesus was going about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and making a public proclamation of the good news concerning the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. And having seen the crowds, he was moved with compassion concerning them because they were exhausted by their troubles and their long, aimless wanderings and had thrown themselves to the ground in an utterly prostrate condition as sheep, not having a shepherd. Then he says to his disciples, the harvest indeed is great, but the workers few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to thrust out workers into his harvest. I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna go to those scriptures actually in uh, my Bible because there are some things here I, I want to, I wanna look at a little more deeply than possibly I first considered as I was studying this, the Holy Ghost is wanting to look at it more deeply. I want you to notice the word for multitude, okay? Uh, the Greek word translated multitude means uh, a throng as born along. In other words, not a group that knows where they're headed, but they're, they're just, just the, the tide, just circumstances are just moving them along. Uh, and, and then... Thayer says that it's a crowd, a casual collection of people, a multitude of men who have flocked together in some place, a throng. But it, he also translates it as multitude, the common people, as opposed to the rulers and leading men. Uh, and then multitude, again, another definition, the multitudes, seems to denote troops of people gathered together without order. So here he is in, this, in these verses. And, and he goes and teaches the gospel of the kingdom and he heals to confirm the word. He heals sicknesses, every sickness, every disease among the people. But 
even with the teaching and with the miracles, he saw that the multitudes were scattered abroad. They were fainting and scattered abroad. The, uh, the word faint here uh, means they, they have uh, lost the ability to go forward. And they're, they're scattered abroad means that uh, through the idea of flinging, to throw, to cast down, to cast forward or before, to settle down, to throw to the ground, to prostrate. That's why the, uh, the Weiss translation translated it prostrate. What this, what, in regards to sheep, what this is talking about is sheep that have fainted or have been cast to the ground are actually called cast sheep. And a cast sheep is in very dangerous position. Even a cast sheep without the weight of wool on their bodies uh, are in a precarious position. When a, when a sheep lays down on its side, it will roll over on its back because the, body, the weight of the body and the mass of the body is so great compared to its very slim legs. There's not enough mass in the legs, not enough weight in the legs to be able to be a counterbalance so that the sheep can rotate itself back up in that position. And so a cast sheep, and this has been true of sheep for all time, because apparently it appears as though from my reading, that sheep are the only animal that has never been in the wild. They've always been domesticated because they always need a shepherd. That's why wandering sheep are in such a dangerous position because they have no one there to lift them up, to pick them up when they're down. When they really get cast, they can't, they can't save themselves. And Jesus saw the multitudes. He saw the spiritual condition they were in, that they were in a condition where they could not save themselves. Why? Because they had no shepherd. So they fainted and they were prostrate or they were, they were fallen to their, they were cast sheep. And he had compassion on them because he knew they were going to die without some one external to themselves, coming to them to reach them with the gospel. He knew that. He knew they could not save themselves. And, and it's not a very complimentary thing in some ways to be, for us to be called sheep. But he is trying to show the relationship between him as the shepherd and us as the sheep. And then as the under-shepherds, and all of us are under shepherds to sheep. All of us are under shepherds to sheep. There's, you know, he's the he is the pastor, uh, and he works through other men that he calls that he does his work of pastoring through. But he, it's not just that pastoral gifting or ministry, that nurturing ministry, that caring ministry that a shepherd does that protecting ministry, that, that overseeing ministry for sheep to make sure that they're not sick, that they're not attacked, uh, that they have uh, green pastures to feed in and still waters to lie beside and drink from because sheep are timid and they're very afraid of rushing water and because if they slip and fall in rushing water, they have no hope. They have no hope in still water they're able to drink without actually being in danger of falling into that water the great majority of the time, unless they're very, very careless. But a sheep uh, is only, uh, it, you know, they only have a short amount of time where they have no hair or wool, and that wool is very heavy, and when it gets wet, uh, you're not swimming. So sheep can't swim with wool. And it doesn't take long after the shearing till that wool begins to grow back out. And it, 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 it's the same thing. It only, it only gets worse the more wool they have. And so sheep 
cannot save themselves. And he's looking at the lost sheep of, uh, of the church and lost sheep of the, the backsliders and the lost sheep of this world. And he knows they cannot save themselves. Well, he has a plan. And that plan is to use his people as conduits for his ministry of, as the good shepherd to reach them, save them, and to take care of them. Now, he switches metaphors or allegories from sheep to the harvest because he was showing the need of the lost to be saved with somebody loving them enough to reach them. And I can't ever love him truly enough, them enough unless I am ultimately letting him love them through me or him love yeah, them through me. I'm not loving them enough. Some can get saved when I'm reaching them with my human emotion, filio, because of the word of God and the spirit of God and all that. There is some fruit, but the great majority cannot be reached like that. I've got to be crucified with Christ so that it's now Christ living in me and through me, and it is Christ's faith that is being exercised in ministry through me, both in word and spirit, so that people can be saved. Now, he switches allegory to dispel one of the great lies, the People who have read the verses says that uh, in the last days there's going to be a great falling away. Yeah. The scripture says in James 5 and 7, and I'm going to go there and read it. James 5 and 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Be patient about what? Be patient about that harvest. The Lord is having expressing his patience in waiting for that last day harvest. And the word of God is telling us to be patient also. Patient over what? Patient to receive that last day harvest. And these verses then apply to uh, Matthew chapter 9 and uh, verse 37. Then said, they, saith he to his disciples, he sees the multitude as sheep that cannot save themselves. And he has compassion on them. And in his compassion, he speaks the end of the thing before the beginning, which proves he's God. He speaks the end of the church age before the beginning of the church age. The church didn't begin until the day of Pentecost. And according to Hebrews chapter 9, that is the beginning of the New Testament because a testament is not in effect or in force until after the death of the testator. And Christ did not die until the end of the four Gospels. And so the church was not established and the New Testament did not begin until Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And so that's the case. So he spoke the end of of the church before the beginning. He said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, what is the purpose of the church? What's the work of the church on the earth? Then he said, Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. This last day harvest is abundant. It is abundant. It is very great. It is very large. The prophet said, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former. And we study the first century church, and we study all that God did in them and to them and through them, by them. And it's glorious. But the glory of the latter house, this last day expression of the church, 
is going to be greater than the glory of that first expression of the church. It's going to be greater. That first expression of the church was built, built directly by the Lord Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus and his ministry on the earth. And the, the prophet says, I believe it's Haggai, uh, he says, Who among you saw the first house in all of its glory? This one is not like it at all. It's not, it's, it's not doesn't approach it in, in sight and view. And he said, yet, even though this expression of the house, same house, but this expression of the house, the latter expression of the house, is going to be greater than, in glory than the first expression of the house. God is going to do more through the last day church than he did through the first day church. Peter seems to, from the very beginning of the church, make this illusion. When he said, they said, what is this? What meaneth this? And he said, this is, uh, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, if you go to the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Hebrew into the Greek, you will find that the words there in the Greek, the Greek translation of Joel 2.28, are not the same Greek words in Acts 2.17. And so when Peter said... This is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith God. That, the Greek words translated the last days is not the Greek words that translated the, the Hebrew words it shall come to pass afterward. Not the same words. Because Paul is, or Peter is saying through the Holy Ghost in the first message ever preached in the church, or by a person in the New Testament. He says to them, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This very thing here that's happening today, this is the fulfillment of that. But that, and that prophecy, and this, this is the foreshadowing, or the that which is going to be poured out in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> it wasn't exactly the last days. So what are the last days? Well, in the last days, there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the earth. And Jesus said it would, go, it would begin in Jerusalem, go to Samaria, Judea, uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, it started in Jerusalem but it's going to end in the uttermost parts because that's the word of God. And he tells us there's not only going to be a last day outpouring, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be beyond our ability to comprehend it. He promised Abraham that the blessing of Abraham would come on every family on the earth. He vowed to Abraham that the blessing of Abraham would come on every nation of the earth. Genesis 12, Genesis 22. And Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that the blessing of Abraham is the Gentiles receiving the promise of the Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. That's not an exact quote, but it's close. So the blessing of Abraham that was promised before Isaac was born, when he was leaving Ur of the Chaldees, when he was starting on his journey of faith, was that every family on earth would be blessed with the blessing of Abraham. And then in Genesis 22, after he offered Isaac, some considerable amount of time passed there, not just 25 years, but anywhere from 35 years to 50 years, depending on how old Isaac was at the time. God said, now that you have offered your son, your only son, uh, I swear with an oath. Huh. 
he swore against his own deity, according to Hebrews 6, that he would pour out his spirit or he would give the blessing of Abraham on every nation of the earth. And that's what's going to happen. That's what God is doing now. And, and I, I, I am thankful for every person that receives the Holy Ghost now. I'm thankful that I got the Holy Ghost or received the Holy Ghost way back then, 62 years ago. I'm thankful that the Lord began to pour out his spirit again in uh, 1900. I'm thankful for all that. But all of this is the prelude bringing us through this religious period where we're trying to keep the rules and obey God for our own salvation's sake. And he's brought us through this phase of the mission of reaching the lost and doing it for God. And we are, he is in the process now of bringing man of God, woman of God after man and woman of God, saint after saint, bringing us to the end of ourselves and bring us into the place of crucifixion so that we can be used of him as his instruments in the harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous. So if people are not being saved, it's not God's, it's not that it's not God's timing for people to get saved. It's not that it's God's, not God's will. It is his will for people to get saved. But what is the problem? The laborers are few. For the love of Christ constraineth us, and we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And in that he died for all, that they that live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That compelling love of God is working in our heart to bring the church, the body of Christ, collectively and individually, to a crucified place in God so that we now can be used of him as laborers with him in his harvest. And he's, we're reaching the lost now and we're growing our churches now, but it's time for us to die because ultimately except, except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. This is the will of God. This is the plan of God. This is the purpose of God. This is what we must do if we're not going to frustrate the grace of God. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. The grace of God is trying to bring us all to the end of ourselves, to bring us into this dimension that he can use us as powerfully effective laborers. The love of Christ is constraining us. It is bringing us down to this place where we're going to have to either walk away or give up on ourselves and say, here I am, God, all of me. From now on, take me. Whatever you want, I want. Whatever you're doing, I'm doing. Whatever you're loving, I'm loving. Whatever you're hating, I'm hating. I'm doing your will and not my own from now on. And he will begin to use us in dimensions he has never used us before. The harvest truly is plenteous. It's an abundant harvest. It is a mind-boggling harvest. It is such a great harvest that it is going to shatter every structure we have created to try to hold this results of the new wine. Every bottle we have made to try to contain what God is doing. He is going to give such a harvest that every structure we have put in place to the best of our ability is not going to survive it. No. We will be creating new structures on the fly because the old structures are going to be so obliterated by this new harvest because he's not going to let any individual and no structure, no religious structure or spiritual structure have its fingerprints on what he's going to do. Nobody is going to be able to take the credit 
for what he does in winding up the church age. Nobody. Nobody. We're going to get to be in the yoke, as I taught in the last lesson. We're going to get to be the mouthpiece. We're going to get to use our hands to pray for the sick and speak the words of power and authority. We're, we will get to do, we got a part in this because his harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. But the laborers are not qualified to be laborers fully until they reach this end of themselves and let him do the laboring through them. Come unto me, all yet labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These things have got to become reality in our lives. And they, they seem so hard. It seems so unattainable. It is when I'm trying to do it, when I'm trying to get there. The way I get there is give up on me. Give up on my life, my will, my way, my plans, my burden, my vision, my passion. Give up on me and die out to him and let him live all of those things that are his through me. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. And finally, he commanded us, he said, pray. The word pray there is in the imperative tense of command. It's a commandment of God for us to pray. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth, thrust out, compel forth laborers into his harvest. And that's what, exactly what he's doing. He is bringing us to the end of ourselves. He's bringing us to the end of our methods. He's bringing us to the end of our ideas. He's bringing us to the end of our capabilities. He's bringing us to the end of our efforts so that we will give up and let him do all of that through us. Now, we're going to be busier than we've ever been. The demands on our time are going to be greater than they've ever been before because there's more, there will be more to be done. But we were not, we're not going to be exhausted and we're not going to be uh, weary and we're not going to give up because weariness is the only way the devil can stop revival. Be not weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And all that we're trying to do for God and living for God so we can be saved and then in working for God so others can be saved. And all of that, is, we have weariness, weariness, and it stops us eventually. It just brings us to a halt. But in this new dimension, I'm not going to have weariness because I'm not going to be the one laboring. I'm just going to be the conduit. I'm not going to be the one who's ultimately whose energy is used. He uses my energy and immediately replenishes it. He begins to put it back. If I will just pray prayers of rest and refreshing and I will trust him, it's all him. There's no pressure on me. In this place of rest in him, there is no pressure. I know. I know how incomprehensible that sounds, how impossible that sounds, and it is if I'm trying to attain to it. But when I give up on me and I let him live in me by his spirit and his word and abide there, and I let him minister his faith through me, there's no pressure on me. All I have to do each day, each moment of the day, is his will, whatever he's telling me to do. If it's sit here and teach hour after hour after hour, fine. If it's sit in my recliner and take a nap, all of that's fine as long as I'm walking step by step with him. It all works. The harvest truly is plenteous. God can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. He calls that those things that are not as though they were. He tells the end of the thing before the beginning. And we can look at all of our efforts, all of our beautiful buildings we've built and all the effort we put into our sermons and all the <clears throat> effort we put into having the best music and the best singing we can do 
and all of that and all the efforts we put into being the nicest people we can be and helping others and loving others and all of that selflessness which is done ultimately by self because we're doing it. All of that can be put down at the feet of the cross, the foot of the cross, and kneel down at Jesus' feet like Mary was constantly doing and give ourselves up to him so that he can do the work through us. And the, har the one who owns the harvest field, the one whose seed is sown causing all this harvest to come up, he, he cares more about reaping that harvest than you or I ever will. So if that harvest is not being reaped, it's not him we, we need to be looking at. We don't need new instruments and new methods. We need his instruments and his methods, and we need him to use them through us, his way, in his timing, because we are submitted to him. The love of God is compelling us to a place of being crucified with Christ so that in that compelled place, we can then be thrust out into the harvest where we go out by his authority and power, being thrust out by, in the military, every person that goes on a mission is being thrust out by authority and power, being sent forth by that authority and power. You know, especially if you know you're going into danger, it, you know, you wouldn't go voluntarily. Most people wouldn't. But we will go because the authority says to go. And we not only go because of that authority and power, but we go with that authority and power, and we go using that authority and power to see his will and his work done. And when that happens, he alone gets all the credit all the glory, he alone, so that it's all done for his kingdom and only for his kingdom. It's all done by his power and only by his power. And it's all done for his glory and only for his glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive this minister, this word and ministry of an impartation of revelation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.